I think I think we can yeah. just start now. Yes, of course. So, um, welcome everyone to uh, what will be the last webinar of the webinar series related to the CFIT project. As you may know, this webinar will be about the environmental performance of CPRO and the comparison to other protein sources in terms of LCA-related performances. Um, as you know, uh, concerning the way this webinar works, there will be a first phase during which Andreas Break, which is here, will present you um, the presentation related to this webinar. This phase will last approximately 40 minutes. And afterwards, there, there will be a 15 to 20 minutes Q&A session. So if you ever have any questions concerning the presentation Andreas will be doing, do not hesitate to write to the panelists to the Q and answers uh, interface that is available on Zoom. If the question is simple, is simple enough, we will try to answer right away. And if the question is a little bit more technical, it will be kept for the question and answer session so that we we'll be able, so that Andreas will be able to give you a proper answer. Um, also, for your information, uh, this webinar will be recorded. So now uh, you will be able uh, to proceed with this information. And I think we can start the, the webinar with uh, the video presentation uh, introduction. And I want to say again, thank you to everyone for being here. Let's start. SIPFID is an international and multidisciplinary four-year project that is funded by the Biobase Industries Joint Undertaking. The project started in September 2017 and aims at scaling up Arbium's wood-to-food -food technology to convert wood residues into protein-rich feeding regions comprised of single-cell proteins called SCP and test it into aquaculture applications. This project gathers 10 partners all along the value chain from wood sourcing till fish feed manufacturing and testing to address the European protein gap. The project will demonstrate Arbium's technology at large scale and also prepare for industrial scale up. At Arbium, our wood to food solution brings wood into the food chain. And like many of the other feedstock being used for fermentation, wood is abundant, forests are increasing, does not compete with food crops and is available year round. It has robust and established supply chains. Our process technology has been validated in our lab and pilots. And thanks to the Seedfield project, we are scaling it up to the demonstration level, getting ready to build our first commercial plant. Arbium process converts food into food in two main steps. First, wood residues are broken down into sugar rich stream. Second, we perform a fermentation of the woody sugar to produce seal pro, our protein rich ingredient that our partners test for aqua feed application. Arbium process is being demonstrated thanks to the expertise and the facilities of Bioprocess Pilot Facility and Biobase Europe Pilot Plant. The project includes the testing of the protein rich ingredient for aquafeed applications. Maltese receives batches of silk pro to perform nutritional analysis, formulate feeds, including this new protein source, and design small scale and large scale trials to test its effects on salmon and tilapia. The CIPI project demonstrates a new value chain bridging the gap between forestry and aquaculture. It will expand the food production potential by valorizing a non-food resource and bringing it into the food chain. Well, thank you, Thormodur. Uh, my name is Andreas Pekke. Uh, I come from the Norwegian organization NORSIS, and I've been responsible for work package six in the Silphid project. Uh, the presentation, uh, I'm sorry, there's too much sun in Norway this day. This presentation is entitled The Environmental Performance of Silk Pro and Comparable Proteins. So thank you for getting this opportunity to show the results and a special thank you to Arbium and all the other partners in the project, uh, Mattis, Norske Skogel Bay, Tweo, 
Processum, Laxa, Sketing, Biobase uh, Europe, and Bioprocess Pilot Facility, both for sharing your knowledge in the project and also developing the project into uh, a useful uh, product. I, during the presentation, I will show you the background uh, where it comes from. Uh, I will uh, uh, give a short introduction to LCA as a method. Uh, I'll talk more closely on LCA work in the Sylphid project uh, and present the results with some sensitivities and uncertainties before I uh, end up with some conclusions. Um, and I'll start with some conclusions as well, so that you can have them uh, in the front of your mind uh, as I go along. Um, what I'm going to end up saying is that Silpro has a good environmental performance compared to other protein sources for fish feed. Uh, and we can say that based on life cycle assessment, uh, also referred to as LCA. And that for some uh, important environmental impacts, we still need to develop methods for capturing how uh, our emissions, the resource uses, how they affect the environment. So first, some background. What we can see internationally is that there's been a big growth in aquaculture up to um, sixfold for, for some uh, volumes. And uh, most of, of the growth in, in fish production and in aquaculture has come from fish farming. So you can see that fish farming has uh, grown a lot while uh, the wild caught fish uh, is almost stable and is projected to be the, that way in, in the next uh, 10 years as well. While the uh, production of fish has grown, um, the amount of protein grown in Europe hasn't grown as much. Um, I mean, proteins for fish feed is just a small portion of the, the protein used for feed applications in Europe. But still, you can see that the uh, imports in uh, Europe has had a small decrease from 2000 to 2010, but has increased again uh, up to uh, 2021. And this increase in, uh, in what is referred to as the protein gap or the protein deficit uh, means that we need novel proteins to support the feed industry in, in Europe. And we need to ensure that those novel proteins that we introduce to the feed system, that we reduce climate footprints, that we save water, we save agricultural land, that we avoid overfishing, and we shouldn't introduce any new problems. And how do we make sure we don't do that? Well, we need to uh, find a method to, to analyze. So in the startup of the Sylphid project, uh, Nursus, or what was then called Östfold Forskning or Östfold Research, uh, was asked to join to perform uh, assessment of the environmental performance of the uh, protein production. Uh, we are a small research institution situated in Fredrikstad and Oslo in Norway. Uh, we're about 30 uh, employees in total, but we're one of the larger environments in the world when it comes to life cycle assessment. And the objectives of the work package that we were granted was to uh, investigate environmental performance. And to do that, we saw that we had to establish some submodels for forestry, for biorefinery, and for feed production. And we had to find good impact assessment methods for making comparisons to other uh, protein sources. And we had to find out what protein sources to compare CIRPRO to. Uh, and what is this LCA that I'm talking about? Um, the old saying says that give a boy a hammer and nails are all he sees. And as a researcher in nurses, all we see are product or product system life cycles. So uh, 
whatever problem you have, you will say that LCA is the answer. So, um, but uh, uh, joke aside, uh, LCA is a, a good method to investigate the environmental impacts from any product life cycle. And it's also the expanded these days to, to look at social impacts and, and also ways of capturing economic sustainability. LCA is a method that on the one hand is standardized through the ISO system, but is on the other hand, it's in constant development uh, as an active scientific community. But uh, both in the standards and in scientific community, the, the basic element is that uh, we, we map uh, the resources used and the effects the resource use and the emissions um, have on uh, on the environment or on uh, other entities that we study. The basic element of an LCA is shown as a, a product uh, value chain uh, is uh, a unit process. An activity it can be whatever a transport activity that just moves the product from one location to another or something that transforms uh, uh, raw material into a product or just changes something slightly. And whenever we want to uh, make changes in the location or the nature of a, uh, of a product, we need to use resources and we get waste, we get emissions to soil, air and water. Uh, and uh, these um, resource use and waste emissions, uh, they have consequences for the environment. These unit processes are put together into value chains that can go from extraction of raw materials to um, intermediate products, to manufacturing of finished products, to use, to end of life activities. Um, and it might still seem a bit easy and simple when you have a, just a chain of activities, but you need to be aware that all the resources and the activity use is a, a value chain in itself. So there are value chains that are feed into the value chain that you are studying, and uh, you always end up with loops that uh, the output of your value chain is probably the input of another value chain. Uh, just the way that you need oil to make steel and you need steel to make oil. So it becomes uh, uh, a large amount of processes that are interwoven in, in complex network structures. And for all those processes, we create inventories of what goes out and what comes in. Uh, and these inventories are then categorized. They are sorted into the impacts they have on the environment. And uh, one of the more well-known, the, the method to uh, characterize the impacts to climate change uh, developed by uh, the IPCC and uh, measured in uh, what is known as CO2 equivalence, where the heating potential of different gases or other, uh, other uh, variables that uh, are uh, um, making global warming, uh, like for instance, uh, land use change, those are translated into uh, the effect uh, compared to one kilogram of CO2. There are similar methods for other potential environmental problems. So this was a very, very brief uh, introduction to LCA and the steps uh, you need to go through. And in the SILPRO life cycle, uh, we decided that we need to create three submodels. Uh, one uh, capturing the, the forestry operations, one capturing the biorefinery, and one capturing the production and use of feed. Uh, the forestry model should reflect the uh, production of beach in the northeastern part of France, as the uh, biorefinery uh, was uh, uh, supposed to be uh, established in Gold Bay, uh, and there are large beach forests that, that needs to be used. 
Uh, we looked at thinning operations more than clear cutting, uh, which also has consequences for the, the, the way you operate the forestry uh, in itself. We used average operations, which is a combination of manual, that is chain saw operations and uh, harvesters, more automatic operations. And we used economic allocation to the divide between clear cutting and the products you get from clear cutting and the products you get from thinning. And then the wood chips coming out of the forestry model is going into a biorefinery model. In 2017, at the beginning of the uh, Sylphid project, we started with a so-called black box model, a one-step model where we had inputs and outputs. That was uh, developed into a two-step model uh, where the production of sugar was uh, introduced as a separate step and then the fermentation into the single cell protein. And this was further refined into a five-step model and a seven-step model. And then finally, uh, in uh, the final stages of the project, it's become a nine-step model to uh, also include the sum down step processing uh, of the single cell protein in itself. Uh, and throughout these uh, developments of the models, there's been a refinement of the data of the inputs and outputs. So, uh, and that has gone uh, hand in hand with the uh, pilot trials so that we have uh, translated what has happened in uh, in the pilot facilities into a model that can uh, depict what would happen in the process of SILPRO in, in a future system. Uh, and uh, one of the, I shouldn't say strange, but often when we do refinement of models, we find that the environmental impacts increase, but it's been the other way in uh, the SILFEED project where we have found uh, or I should say RBM has found uh, more environmentally friendly uh, inputs uh, and processes to create the, the single cell protein. And then lastly, uh, coming out the SILPRO uh, product uh, goes into the feed model, uh, which consists of a transport stage where uh, we have located feed production at the west coast of Norway to uh, reflect the, the main production in Europe. But we have also tested the results for other production sites to, to make sure that they would be valid across Europe uh, for uh, production at Bay with beach. We have looked at uh, energy for feed production, where we have got uh, numbers from actual fish feed producers. Uh, we have looked at transport to fish farm, where again, we have had uh, located the fish farm in, in Norway uh, and uh, the fish feed itself has been either without Silpro or with a, a, a mix of 10 or 20 percent of Silpro uh, as a substitute to uh, a plant mix consisting of wheat and um, soy protein concentrate. Um, at first when we started developing the feed model we would also want like to look at if there were any differences in performance, for instance, in growth of salmon or in, um, in its survival or in the nutritional value. Uh, but from the fish feed trials, we can find any significant uh, differences. There were some differences in digestibility, but they weren't large enough or couldn't really be translated into uh, differences that can be captured in the LCA model. So when we had created the framework for uh, making the production chain of Silpro, we also had to uh, find out what protein sources Silpro should be compared to. So if you want to substitute Silpro uh, to one of the uh, other protein sources that a fish feed producer could use. Uh, we did a systematic uh, investigation and ended up with uh, five categories of protein sources, which were uh, soy products, 
or uh, different types of fish meal or rapeseed meal uh, or insect meal from different uh, insect types or I should say insect larvae uh, or single cell proteins made from other sources than wood. So these five categories of protein sources were selected based on a, a four criteria uh, from uh, that they should either be produced or imported to Europe in large amounts uh, or they should be a few important future uh, source or they should be uh, and they should be relevant to substitute in fish feed and it should be possible to find some data on the environmental performance uh, and maybe for that last criteria we were a bit optimistic when we did a screening study we found that we could uh, in fact find uh, LCA data for uh, those five categories but uh, digging further into the uh, the information, uh, we could only find uh, LCA results on the climate change impact across studies. There were a few instances of uh, studies of acidification or eutrophication, uh, but none that were comparing uh, across categories or that we could find for all other categories. So in a literature study of uh, the different protein categories, we found wide ranges in results, uh, both stemming from uh, differences in the actual production chains, that they either used waste resources that could have a lower environmental impact, uh, or that it uh, introduced some land use change that created lots of uh, uh, climate change impacts. But there were also uh, substantial differences in the methods employed. And so one of the things we had to do was to uh, make uh, the different uh, data sets for all the proteins that we were comparing to, so that they would be using the same data sources and using the same assumptions and methods uh, across all the protein sources. And in addition to climate change, we chose five different uh, environmental impact categories. And these were chosen based on uh, being part of what is called the product environmental footprint category rules for feed for food producing animals. And product environmental footprint is uh, Europe's method for characterizing uh, the environmental performance of different products not just feed, it can be electronic products or uh, batteries or shampoos or whatever, uh, but there's a specific one made for feed for food producing animals. And that uh, those uh, category rules say that there are at least six uh, environmental impacts that should be included in any analysis. And those are climate change, it's particulate matter, it's acidification, it's land use, eutrophication, and water scarcity. And uh, when we had established the uh, protein categories, we had established the uh, environmental impacts to look at. We did a first analysis uh, in autumn 2019. Uh, and the results, uh, we were that there has been improvements in the uh, production chain of uh, Silpro and in the data for all the different protein categories. But there's also been a different selection of proteins to compare with, as I will uh, come to in a minute. But the main message from this figure is that uh, here, with a relative ranking of the different protein sources, you can see that the colors are different for each of the uh, environmental impact categories. This means that for these proteins, there are no protein that uh, has the best performance across all categories, and all of them has the worst performance in at least one category. Um, and this means that uh, uh, you will have a problem shift if you go from one uh, protein to another, but there might be differences in importance. 
So from uh, 2019 and from the refinement of the work, we have also been involved in a, a critical review process. So it means that we've had uh, external experts that have gone through the model, they've gone through all the data, they've gone through uh, the assumptions and uh, the way results have been presented uh, and given feedback on uh, how things should be and what we have had to change. Uh, as uh, uh, positive of this process is that we can uh, communicate results with higher confidence. Uh, it has also improved the, the work on sensitivities and uncertainties. Um, and it uh, meant better results also from the feed model. Uh, I'm not gonna read all uh, the results from uh, from this table, uh, but I uh, hope the uh, presentation will be made available uh, also after the presentation so that uh, you have the time to study this in, in uh, your own office and, and see uh, how the different uh, protein sources, uh, how they compare across categories. Uh, and I will pick uh, a few of this to to highlight some of the, the more important results. And uh, in the world we live in, and with the uh, IPCC uh, starting to publish uh, the, the work from AR6 uh, uh, one and a half weeks ago, uh, climate change, uh, I would say, is, is the most important category to communicate. It might not be the most important category for protein feeds or um, uh, in any uh, instance, but you need to communicate this and you need to have uh, a low enough climate change impact as possible. What we can see in this graph is that uh, SILPRO on the further uh, left of, of the graph uh, is uh, among the, the midst of the bunch here. Um, what we have done from the uh, results that we've shown for the autumn 2019 is that we have separated the, the soy protein concentrate, uh, abbreviated here to SPC, uh, into uh, a soy protein concentrate without deforestation, which has a quite small um, impact on climate change, and a soy protein concentrate with deforestation, which is worse than, than any of the other protein sources that we have investigated. Um, we've also seen that uh, some of the novel proteins, the single cell protein as uh, bacterial protein meal or insect meal, have uh, a bit higher uh, uh, impacts to climate change than the SILPRO target values. Uh, some of the agricultural products and also the insect meal uh, shows uh, smaller uh, impacts to climate change. Uh, I said that the critical review process has uh, refined some of the uncertainty measurements. And what we can see for climate change, uh, shown here with the uh, arrows going up and down from the, from the bars, uh, this shows the uncertainty in uh, the values, uh, both uh, reflecting uncertainties in data and in the models themselves. And climate change is uh, a model with a low level of uncertainty compared to other um, LCA models. So uh, the results that I, uh, that I just showed are uh, pretty confident. Uh, although you can see that uh, SILPRO no is shown on, on the right side, I, I apologize for that. Um, if we see the, the, the upper boundaries for the uh, SILPRO target, then that might be higher than the lower values for uh, single cell protein as bacterial protein meal, for instance. If we go to another environmental impact category, like water use, uh, the results almost become uh, nonsensical because the uncertainty in both the data 
uh, and in the models themselves are larger than the actual results. So uh, one of the conclusions is that we can't really, uh, we can give you some indications on what to use, but we can't really say whether it's higher or lower than any of the other protein sources. When it comes to land use, uh, we used a novel method uh, developed in the EU called LANCA. Uh, and with this method, SILPRO here on, on the right side was one of the worst um, protein sources that we looked at. Uh, that was mostly stemmed from the uh, characterization factor, that is the, the land use factor for French forests, which was uh, high. I meant that uh, using a French forest to produce a raw material for proteins was more intensive than using agricultural land, for instance. Also because a tree grows slower than um, an agricultural plant. But this graph shows that if you use another um, impact method for land use, then uh, the value for uh, SILPRO becomes among the smaller, at least of those made on land, because all the, uh, the fish, uh, fish meal products are uh, still uh, almost ridiculously small. Uh, and why I use such a strong word is that uh, we don't really have a land use method for, uh, for uh, the oceans. So we don't really reckon what happens on the seabed. I mean, I talked about overfishing as being a problem with fish meal and being a reason for fish feed producers to, to turn to uh, agricultural sources of proteins. Uh, we don't really have a good method to capture this in LCA as it is now. Uh, going from results of the uh, all the protein sources, I want to give you some results for uh, the production chain for Silpro. Uh, this uh, can seem like a bit, this figure seems a bit messy. Uh, it's a so-called LCA network showing how different uh, uh, processes, different materials, how they contribute to the actual result within an environmental impact category. So what we can see here is that most of the um, impacts for Silpro comes from heat from natural gas, it comes from nutrients, enzymes, and nitric acid. Uh, I'll go further into details for climate change in, in a minute. I just want to show you that if you look at land use, the uh, everything disappears except the, the wood chips. So it's only the uh, supply of wood chips that uh, that contribute to the land use results for for Silpro. And similarly, if you look at uh, water use, then it's the uh, production of enzymes and the use of tap water at the biorefinery that contributes to uh, the water use. And there are some green arrows here, and, and they show uh, the recycling of water when they are put through a, a, a wastewater treatment facility and then uh, disposed of uh, and can be used again, either as gray water or, or as uh, rinsed water. So if you look further into climate change, we can see that uh, we can look at what steps of the uh, biorefinery process that are more important. Uh, but it, it might be, um, uh, you shouldn't look too much at this graph because it's not like you can skip process step six uh, and uh, uh, avoid drying. You need to go through all these steps in order to, um, to produce the single cell protein. But looking at what materials and energy that goes into each of these process steps, as we can see here, can tell us where we need to look for uh, improvements uh, with regard to climate change impacts. And we can see that 43% of the impacts stem from uh, the natural gas, the burning of natural gas for drying heat. Um, and then there are three um, 
the nitric acids, the uh, nutrient and enzymes are about the same uh, size. And it, so you can focus the uh, achievements to reduce and mitigate uh, the climate change impacts. And this has been the uh, objective for sensitivity analysis. Uh, and when we first looked at electricity for production, uh, where you can see the electricity, uh, if you use a French electricity mix, it just increases a little bit from not using any electricity at all, which is of course impossible. Uh, and But putting the uh, production in Norway would also only decrease the impacts to climate change by a very small amount. But uh, a message to take home from this graph is that uh, if this uh, was situated in China with an average electricity production in China, the uh, results would almost double. What you remember from the 43% uh, contribution of natural gas for drying, we looked at other sources uh, of uh, energy for drying. And if we use wood or the boiler that is already in place in Moshke School, we could reduce the uh, impact with about uh, 0 0.8 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of protein in the Silpro product. So uh, there are good ways to reduce the, the climate footprint of the Silk Pro uh, product. If we uh, look at other uh, sugar sources that could be used for the same production, you have tried to compare uh, the sugar from uh, that we have in the um, Silk Pro production chain uh, from beech with sugar from cane, beet, or corn which are common sources uh, for sugar worldwide. And we can see that uh, there isn't anything to, to gain from, uh, from switching to another source and we lose the advantage of not using agricultural land. Uh, I've briefly mentioned allocation. Uh, allocation is, uh, the, the word for uh, distribution of impacts in a multi-output uh, uh, process. So if you have a process that creates more than one product, you need to find a way to separate between the two products if you can't uh, model it so detailed that you don't need to. Uh, what we can see is for Silpro that we have used an economic allocation method to uh, allocate between the lignin that is produced and the uh, uh, celluloid that is uh, made into single cell protein. If that uh, is changed to uh, mass, dry mass or uh, energy allocation, it doesn't really change the results. But using a total mass allocation will make the results much worse because the lignin product is uh, drier than the cellulose product. But it will also be false because it doesn't really reflect the, the product that is going through the uh, product chain. But if we didn't have as complete and detailed information as we did, we could end up with uh, having high results that will be uh, uh, false results from, from this uh, product chain. If you look at the actual value for economic uh, allocation that we've used, you can see that we have had a, a similar economic value for cellulose and lignin. But if we change that value to uh, a zero value of lignin, then uh, the uh, result changes from about 2.4 to, uh, to just below three kilograms of CO2 equivalents per kilogram of protein in the Silpro uh, product. If we look at uh, the use of the silpro protein in the feed, uh, we have compared uh, at the one kilogram of feed level, and you can see that there are almost no changes uh, in, in either category when we uh, 
include Silpro instead of the plant mix uh, consisting of wheat and uh, zinc, uh, soy protein concentrate. So there are some uh, gains to, to uh, receive in acidification, in particulate matter, in eutrophication. Uh, and there are some uh, negative impacts to, to have in land use and water use, uh, while climate change is almost stable. This is if we use uh, a soy protein concentrate from uh, Brazil without deforestation. But the results change if you look at uh, single cell protein with deforestation. Then we can have an actual gain per kilogram of fish feed uh, in the climate change category. And in almost all categories, except for land use and water use, where you still have uh, an increase when using Silpro. Uh, and most of, of that uh, difference is because of uh, soy uh, being grown twice a year means that it requires less area and uh, less land and less water because it's not irrigated than uh, the production and the manufacturing of Silpro. So from all these results uh, uh, presented, how can this be used? Uh, it can be used as information to end consumers. If you want to know uh, the, the actual environmental impact of the salmon that you're having for dinner, uh, or if you want to understand uh, specific ingredients in the production chain of the salmon, whether that be the Silpro or uh, protein source, Courses. It can be used as information to the fish feed producers or the fish farmers that need to document their uh, environmental performance or to select the protein ingredients. And it can be used to improve Arbium's production process or to document uh, to the actors that are mentioned above. So to summarize uh, the Environmental performance of the production chain for Silpro has been documented in the work, work package six of the Silfeed project. Uh, we have developed comprehensive models for uh, the forestry part, the biorefinery part, and also the feed production and use part of the Silpro uh, life cycle. We have uh, identified areas of improvement for environmental performance. We have uh, compared the performance, uh, the environmental performance to other protein sources and found out that it's in within the same range uh, for most environmental impact categories uh, with the most likely uh, proteins to be substituted. Uh, and we've seen that uh, for new impact methods like land use and water use, uh, we have increased the understanding, the knowledge of the methods and uh, what how they should be developed in order to, to gain understanding of uh, the actual impacts of protein sources. There's been some difficulties in uh, uh, getting access to viable data for production chain, not uh, just the difficulties in Silpro uh, not having its uh, production chain established yet, but also for the other protein sources. It's been difficult to work with new methods for environmental impacts and uh, um, how to develop them. Uh, and also uh, to compare the results when the environmental issues across different uh, products are uh, very different. Uh, and that is a message to, to send back to the LCA community as well, that uh, when we look at novel ingredients made from uh, non-agricultural products uh, or other industrially made uh, products, we need to be aware that it can actually be compared on uh, common grounds. So if you look at the conclusions, uh, we can say that Silpro, uh, when used in Europe, it can save 75% of greenhouse gas emissions if you compare to Brazilian soy protein concentrate uh, where uh, deforestation occurs. Uh, it says about half the greenhouse gas emissions compared to production of bacterial protein meal. 
and it saves about 30% of greenhouse gas emissions compared to uh, an insect meal protein made from black salty fly larvae. When it comes to conclusions uh, on water use and land use, those are difficult to draw uh, because of uh, uh, large uncertainties in the methods and in the data material. So uh, getting back to where we started, Silpro performs well uh, environmentally compared to other protein sources used in fish feed. The performance can be improved through more use of renewable energy sources or through sustainable sourcing of acids, nutrients, and the methods for important environmental impacts, they need to be improved in order to be able to compare different protein sources, especially uh, considering land use and water use. The only um, thing left for me in this presentation is to say thank you for listening. So thank you. Thank you, Andreas. It was a really great presentation. So now we will be able to start the question and answer time and the public uh, transmitted to the panelists several questions. The first one is related to the, um, to the water use part of the LCA. Uh, the question is the following one. Uh, what if a different method was used to estimate the water use similarly than what has been displayed for the land use with the RIS-IP versus PEF method? Um, those a different method for the water use would have allowed to have more certain results or results with less uncertainties? Uh, no. We have tried to uh, include uh, the, I should first say that the water use uh, method that we have used is called uh, AWARE, AWARE uh, and it's uh, a method that tries to characterize the, the gap between, uh, sorry, the gap between the water available in an area and the water that you use. So it's a, a number that uh, reflects the water scarcity. Uh, there's one other major water use method in LCA uh, developed by the United Nations Environmental Programme that characterizes water into uh, green, blue, and gray. Uh, and it gives it a value uh, depending on on its use, uh, but uh, when running through that model, it had all uh, even bigger uncertainties than than the ones we found with the aware method. Okay, um, thank you for the answer. Um, I think it was really uh, helpful for the for the person who asked that did, who asked that in the public. There's been another question from uh, from the public, which was um, which was about the the potential impact the LCA done during the CFID project could have on the LCA community. So, do you think that the LCA done during the project uh, will have a certain impact impact to the community given the specificity of the case study? Uh, yeah, uh, in uh, in a couple of ways, I'd say we've we've done presentations at the LCA Food Conference, uh, where we did comparison of different environmental impact methods uh, and different databases used for product environmental footprints and uh, and for uh, the LCA that we made during the project. So I think we've uh, in in that work we showed that there might be uh, differences that should be uh, considered. Uh, with the specific results, uh, we have, uh, I, I didn't mention that during the presentation, but we have uh, uh, published uh, LCA data for beach production in France uh, as publicly available data. We're waiting for them to be uploaded at the GLAD network so that uh, these wood chips can be used uh, for other purposes. Uh, and uh, regarding the uh, insect meal, insect larvae meal production, 
We've also uh, consolidated data from a lot uh, of different sources uh, and are uh, about to publish those data in, uh, in a journal these days, which I think will be useful for the LCA community. And I also think the uh, discussions with the critical review panel, um, both uh, distinguished experts within uh, LCA of food uh, and feed ingredients in particular, um, have uh, been an eye opener both to to us in the project, but it has also helped them to to see some issues, uh, especially related to novel feeds made in uh, industrial production uh, compared to agricultural uh, agriculturally produced feeds. Thank you for this answer, Andreas. Uh, another question which has been asked by the public was if the SILFID case study will allow improvements concerning the LCA data models uh, in the future. For example, uh, I think that what the public wanted to say uh, through this question was maybe related to the PEF uh, method for the land use and uh, notably if the case study of SILFID could have a low refinement for the PEF land use criteria in terms of uh, new protein sources, notably? Uh, yeah, uh, we definitely hope so. Um, uh, I appreciate the question because uh, uh, we think that uh, the uh, dialogue that we can have with uh, the PEF developers and the uh, the PEF community uh, with regard to the usability and the understanding of the results from the Lanka method will be important. Because uh, uh, during the, the project, we haven't come across uh, any use of the Lanka method for uh, other than research purposes. So we are very keen on, on finding out whether any producers have been able to use the Lanka method and how that would be compared to the results that we have. And also we have come across difficulties in, um, in the data description or what data to use for um, to describe land use in different instances. So we're still a bit unsure on on whether we have actually characterized the, the right land use in uh, the wood chips production. Uh, and this also connects to an even larger question about the what the land use category, what it's supposed to reflect. The Lanka method says that it uh, uh, gives a value for the soil quality so it says something about uh, how your production chain, how that uses soil that could be used for different purposes and whether you uh, sort of, uh, you uh, refuse other uses of the, of the same soil. But there are other land use uh, methods that are either just plainly telling how many square feet or square meters of of land that you're using without any characterization. And there are other methods that are trying to link to uh, biodiversity and the uh, capacity to uh, for uh, biological production. And I think those are those are really important to develop and to to have a discussion between the uh, those methods and the Lanka method. Hmm. Thank you for, uh, for the answer once again, Andreas. It was, as the other ones, very instructive. Um, so that was all the current questions which has, have been asked by the public. If there is other questions or new, um, new, um, new questions to, that the public would like to ask, I invite you to click on the raising hand option on the Zoom interface and to start writing your question. If there are no more questions, I think uh, we could uh, end the webinar. So I think we will wait uh, 
30 seconds, one minute to see if there are any uh, interest for new questions. And uh, elsewhere, I think uh, this would be the end of the webinar. So feel free to, to solicit us if you have any questions. But will the public have mm. uh, the possibility to raise their hand? Uh, yes, I think it is in the interface, right, Tormodo? The the public, yeah. Yeah, so he, he said yes. But I don't see any hands raised. So I think that no more questions need to be asked uh, from the public. So I want once again to thank everyone for participating in this webinar, which is the last one of the webinar series, but also the last event, uh, the last official event related to the CFIT project, which concludes four years of collaborative work between all the partners of the consortium. So I want to thank the public, but also all the members of the consortium who weren't able to be here for the webinar. So thank you, everyone. I really wish you a great day. And uh, I think we can end the webinar here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.